sit here and live dangerously. I'm Moisen Mostafavi, Chairman of the Architectural Association. I'd like to welcome you to this symposium on sustainability. We at the AA are uh, very happy to be hosting this symposium, which attempts to address the relationship between the political and theoretical basis of sustainability and actual design possibilities. All of this, I think, placed in the context of our hopes and aspirations uh, for a better and more democratic uh, society. I would like to thank Bill Dunster, a unit master at the AA in the Intermediate School, and Simos Yanis, uh, director of the uh, Graduate School's Environment and Energy Studies Program for organizing this event. And of course, there are also a number of other people, uh, members of Inter7, um, as well as other uh, people in the Graduate School who have been uh, supporting this endeavor, and all the other participants uh, for their um, um, support um, and uh, uh, attendance here today. The um, first session of the uh, symposium addresses the whole question of definition, defining sustainability, and what is the political and theoretical basis of sustainable architecture. The uh, presentations uh, will be fairly brief, and at the end of each session, uh, there will be a discussion period. The first presenter, Edward Goldsmith, will actually uh, make a longer presentation. Uh, Edward Goldsmith is the founder of the Ecologist magazine and author of Blueprint for Survival, which was published in 1972, which was instrumental in leading to the development of the, of the Green Party. His more recent book, among many others, is The Way, An Ecological Worldview. Would you please join me in welcoming Edward Goldsmith. Uh, thank you very much. I bought some copies of The Ecologist, so please help yourselves if you want to, um, if you want one of them. There's several, quite a lot there. Um, I think well, I see it as my task to question assumptions. That's how my mind works. And uh, I think there are a lot of assumptions that need questioning. We tend to assume that the world we live in is normal, uh, just like a child living in the sewers of Rio de Janeiro probably thinks it's normal to live in the sewers and to be shot at by the police. Our academics, our scientists are convinced that, um, I mean, our social scientists think that our society is normal. Our economists are quite convinced that our economy is normal and uh, et cetera. And I think you probably feel that the, your, the, uh, the sort of settlements we're designing are normal settlements. Uh, well, it's always been my view that none of these things are normal. We live in a very aberrant and necessarily short-lived type of society, and all these sort of things, all these things have to be re-questioned, and they're going to change pretty quickly. I think we can start off with the words. Uh, since I'm going to be talking about sustainability, of course, sustainability is a buzzword today. Uh, more so sustainable development. For me, I'm afraid to say sustainable development is a contradiction in terms. If our society and the natural environment are both being degraded at a massive rate, I see that because neither of them can su sustain the present impact of our economic activities. And uh, uh, to increase this impact still further, as we plan to do, by uh, developing a global economy, which we're doing now, is in my view irresponsible and cynical in the extreme. 
if you want to do anything about our society, which is crumbling in front of our noses, and the environment, which is, well, I mean, it's being subjected to the most terrible, terrible, terrible punishment, then we, all we can possibly do is reduce the impact of our activities on it, not, dec not increase it. Now, for me, development necessarily involves increasing the impact of our activities on the environment, and uh, therefore the notion of the idea of sustainable development is to me a total contradiction in terms. Uh, what has to be done is to reduce this impact, which in effect would mean de-developing. It means putting the process into reverse, something no one is quite is willing to face. So I'm involved with about 45 people, mainly in America, there's some here, who are actually, I produ we just produced a book called uh, the case against the global economy, which is coming out in September, Sierra Club Books in America. There are 45 articles in there by a whole lot of people, so a few by me, the conclusion by me, others, and there we are asking for the reversal of current policies. There is no other possibility. Now, before one could, development, uh, before, we, um, b before I talk about development, let's just talk about the notion of sustainability as opposed to development. For me, sustainability is stability, a homeostasis. You know, Jim Lovelock's notion that Gaia is trying to maintain a homeostasis. He wouldn't quite put it in those words. Homeostability, maintaining the basic structure of a natural system. That's what, for me, natural systems are trying to do at different levels of organization within the hierarchy of the biosphere. Uh, now, that, that, and to maintain your homeostasis, I mean, uh, means for me, also maintaining the homeostasis or the stability or the integrity of all the larger natural systems of which uh, you are part. That's to say there cannot be a stable farm or stable settlement in an unstable society. There can't be a, a sustainable society in an unsustainable uh, biosphere. And there cannot be a sustainable biosphere if your climate is being dramatically destabilized as it is today. So in fact, homeostasis, which is something, this is something li missing from the literature, I've made a big point of it in this book, The Way, which is largely about that. Maintaining homeostasis means, above all, maintaining the homeostasis of the whole. Something that is sustainable must be doing just that. Now, th let me define development, because I don't think it's been properly defined. It's seen as something purely economic, but that's only because we tend to see economics, the economic process, as being t uh, this occurring in, a, in the total void, uh, we forget that if it wasn't, they forget that it occurs in a, the, uh, by a social and ecological context. And if it didn't, there wouldn't be any economics. Uh, we forget that. And so, I mean, in fact, for me, economics has to be written almost from scratch. Some uh, people are trying to do that. Herman Daly's book, I don't know if you know it, the, uh, for the common good. He wouldn't say he does that, but it's really what he's doing. Now, development for me, then, is a social and ecological process as much as an economic one. And it is for me, above all, uh, the systematic usurpation by the state and by corporations uh, for all of all those functions that were previously fulfilled by the family and the community and the ecosystems and the biosphere as a whole for free. In other words, if you take the biosphere, including uh, traditional families and communities, not modern ones, which are sort of cancerous growth, uh, they are all, for me, as natural. I mean, there's nothing less natural. I mean, a, f a community is not less natural than an atom or a molecule. You see, the idea of distinction between natural sciences and other sciences is nonsensical. It's just as real and just as natural. There have always been families and communities. Now, uh, they are, they, between them, they full did everything. You see, there's nothing that wasn't done at the level of the family. We, 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 families and communities around themselves produced their food, generated their own religion, did every damn thing. There's nothing they didn't do. And the ecosystems did everything too, maintained the life support systems of our planet. But with development, these things are taken over. Because when things are allowed to do things themselves, when the biosphere and so societies are allowed to do things themselves, they don't charge anything. The functions are fulfilled for free. And of course, that doesn't serve our purposes, as zero GNP. So to increase GNP and satisfy the requirements of the state and the, and the corporations, these functions are systematically usurped. So and instead of allowing uh, uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria uh, to, p to provide the nitrogen for our fields, we, uh, we have fertilizer factories. And instead of allowing uh, uh, the normal predators and parasites to control p potential pests or pests, we spray the bloody the whole world with pesticides, etc., etc. 
Now, and, and of course, we don't allow people to bring up their children or look after the old. We have old people's homes, and so it goes on. We take over all these functions. Now, the trouble is, if you remove somebody's functions, that person has nothing to do, and he'll tend to just disintegrate. You know, people need functions, and families need functions, and communities need functions. And if we well, the main reason, there are many others, why the family and the community are disintegrating so rapidly is that they no longer have any functions to fulfill. If we want to restore them, the first thing you have to do is to return to them some of their functions. Now, this, I'm afraid to say, is what we're going to be having, have, we're going to have to do. Because this, what I refer to as a great usurpation, i.e. economic development, has reached a point where it can't continue very much longer for a host of different reasons. And that is the state and the corporations are incapable of fulfilling these functions anymore. You can see yourself that they're giving it up. They're giving up. They can't do it. You see, they can't provide welfare, especially in the context of the global economy. All the loonies have been released into the streets in principle because they, we are told community care is better than the state care, which I'm sure is absolutely correct, but they forget there aren't any communities. So 40% of the homeless are now sleeping on park benches and throttling the odd passerby, and uh, soon it'll be the old and the abandoned children and the disabled. Everybody will be sleeping on park benches. Uh, we will, we're just giving up, you see. The only answer to that one, of course, the first answer is to get rid of the global economy, but the uh, other reason is to restore the family in the community, which is quite capable of fulfilling these functions. Of course, it's perfectly clear, of course, that climate, when it comes to climate, uh, the, the mechanisms which have assured the stability of climate for hundreds of millions of years have, have can't cope anymore with all the greenhouse gases we're pouring into the atmosphere. And now the National Academy of Sciences and others in America are telling us that we, the engineers must take over and that we must um, put in 50, among other things, 50,000 mirrors of 100 square kilometers each put into space to reflect away the heat of the sun. In other words, here we are trying to take over functions that obviously cannot be taken over. We've reached a point where we simply can't take over any more of these functions. In many areas, we can no longer provide people with goods and services. We can't provide them with jobs. In the Ivory Coast today, uh, the, uh, the formal economy, which is supposed to provide everybody with all the goodies they need and all the jobs they need, I, is actually providing, within a few years, it's going to provide 6% of the jobs. And if it provides 6% of the jobs, it means it, it's, no, it's become irrelevant to people's lives because no one will be able to buy anything it produces. So what we're seeing today is the systematic marginalization of the formal economy, which will be providing, taking play, which will actually be playing an increasingly insignificant role in people's lives. Because what's happening with the Ivory Coast is what's going to happen in many other parts of the world, not everywhere else. So hence, we have to re reverse it. We have to return many functions slowly to the, to the family, the community, to the boss here, in fact. There is no alternative. We can't just go on taking over these functions and, uh, as we've been doing up to now. So instead of having a global economy, we have to create a local economy. Uh, that is a thesis of this massive book that all my colleagues and I have done. And, um, of course, it has considerable implications, um, well, for what you people are involved in. Among other things, here we are building more and more houses uh, without any for, to accommodate the breakdown of the family. I saw the other day that we needed 700,000 houses in the southeast of England, not because there are more people, but because the family is disintegrating still further, and we need to accommodate the broke down, broken down family. We have, to, I think, 2.5 people, or is it 2.3 people per house? We used to have probably 10 to 15. We think it's a great deal. It's wonderful to find rows of little bungalows with ancient ladies uh, all by themselves with a washing machine for company. We think this is great. You see, it's obviously great for the building industry, but it's a disaster socially. They should be there with their families. They'd be much happier. And you could put the whole population of this country in 5 million houses rather than 21 million. Do you, but you'd have bigger houses as we used to have. It's a different approach. If you want to restore the, the family and the community, you have to accommodate the family and the community. You have to, uh, you have to accommodate them in various ways, and you have to create settlements which accommodate them, which make it possible for them to thrive, which we're not doing. We're building housing estates which are aberrations. You know, they should never have been built. Uh, you should build settlements with churches and shops, not these terrifying places where people sit there and rot. It's, uh, uh, Anyhow, if we do put this whole process into reverse, we will, in fact, uh, be solving a lot of problems. You can see that um, um, bringing things back to the norm, letting things fill their normal func thing f functions again, if things fall back into place after this terrible uh, industrial uh, experience, will provide us with, will serve as a sort of solution multiplier. 
Just as when, as we develop, we create hosts of problems. You use fertilizers and pesticides, you can, I can do a catalog, endless catalog of the consequences of using artificial fertilizer. I won't, I won't encumber you with them. But when you actually move in the opposite direction, you're solving hosts of problems. For instance, you, who I see this, this meeting, are very concerned with the problem of energy. If you were to reduce energy consumption by 60%, which can be done on the basis of today's technologies worldwide, this is the end, 60%, uh, uh, which you have to do, by the way, if you want to have a chance of, of preventing the total destabilization of climate, which could lead to making this planet uninhabitable within a matter of decades, depending on the various positive feedbacks that there are, uh, uh, then you have to cut it down by 60 80%, but this would solve a host of problems as well. You know, this would reduce the pollution in our cities, make people much healthier, it would make us far less dependent on the Middle East, an area of great instability, of our oil, it would reduce cost to industry, if that's an advantage. It would also uh, provide a vast number of jobs because everything, there's lots of things involved, like insulation, doing things on a much smaller scale. It would help return to the much more decentralized type of economy, of, a, of the local, localized economy as opposed to the globalized economy, in fact, uh, which we have to create in any case as being the one that, is, that has the minimum impact on our environment, the one which is most socially desirable, etc., etc., etc. You can draw an entire catalog of the advantages of, of, uh, of, uh, of reducing energy consumption to 60 to 60%, which of course is not sufficient, but it's, it's already a fantastic start. And this is an example of the sort of moves, of the consequence, of the beneficial effects of reversing this terrible process of development, uh, which we assume to be in inevitable, can't stop progress, and also beneficial. And there's absolutely no evidence of any kind that it is beneficial. In fact, we've had 500% increase in development since 1950, and never has there been more unemployment, more homelessness, more poverty, more environmental destruction, more everything else. And as for free trade and trade in general, there's been uh, 11, uh, 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 trade has increased by 11 times since 1950. And look at the consequences of that. And here we are convinced that these are the way, these provide the method, development and free trade provide the method of solving all our problems. They are the cause of all our problems. This is the most fundamental of the assumptions that we have to reconsider. Thank you. Our next speaker is Councillor Mike Wooding of Oxford City, Oxford City Council. Uh, Dr. Wooding is a lecturer in psychology at Oxford University and uh, has been involved in green politics since the mid-80s, both at the local and national level. Uh, Dr. Mike Wooding is also the spokesperson of UK Association of Green Party Councillors. It's a great privilege to be here and also to follow Edward Goldsmith because as was mentioned in, in his introduction, his ideas and writings were instrumental in the founding of uh, the Green Party, which uh, is the reason why I spend my life juggling between an academic and a political career. And not only did he, uh, more than 20 years ago, say everything um, for the first time uh, before I got on the scene and uh, um, was able to say it again in my local community and within the Green Party, but of course he's done it again this morning and said everything that I think many of us will want to reiterate in his excellent presentation just now. Because those of you who've had a chance to look through um, the synopsis that uh, we, we all provided will have seen that my thesis is, is very similar t to his, that conventional political and economic theory has developed, as I say, in a state of separation from the ecology of the planet. And look at that another way, and you'll see that all wealth in society throughout the world is derived from nature although we go to extreme lengths to try and hide that fact from us. So if we look around the room today, everything in this room is at base derived from natural products, all the clothes we're wearing, all the building materials, and if you go out into the street, the same is true. Even the most highly engineered goods in our society, uh, machines like cars and satellites and things, they're all derived from natural products. And what we have done over the last uh, few hundred years of industrialization is lose sight of the fact that human society, human economics, is a totally 
dependent subsystem of the natural ecosystems of the planet. And what we have done also is to place um, high value on goods that we engineer and that we manufacture and transform from the raw material state and place very, very low value indeed on natural goods, raw materials and uh, wilderness areas. And I see this daily in the decisions that as a local authority member we are making. We find that time and time again, and it's just a small example at the local level, if developers march in with huge amounts of money and want to build a high-tech leisure complex, which is the latest issue that you may have read about in the national press happening in Oxford, if they want to do that, most people fall down and say, oh yes, come and bring wealth, bring jobs, bring everything else, despite the fact that complex as an example of a lot of modern development, will increase traffic and pollution in our local area, will not provide many jobs compared to the alternative sort of investment that um, Edward Goldsmith indicated, will lead to a loss of a sense of place and community because people for their entertainment will drive large distances across the county, come to an anonymous commercial development which has no respect for its situation within the heart of a historic city. And so we see it on that, in that local example an, um, a microcosm, if you like, of what is happening worldwide with the internationalization of trade and finance, the breakdown of community, and the disregard for the natural wealth and the natural values which lie at the root of all wealth um, within this planet. And so as we try to uh, intervene in this downward spiral and put ourselves back on the path of sustainability, how are we going to do that? Well, I believe that ultimately we will need a decentralization of the global economy, a reassertion of the value of local community and the, the control that local community can have over its own environment. Because so often what local people, what local communities know about is the state of their social uh, well-being and the state of their environment. And they are just the criteria which are totally ignored by international financiers and businessmen and bankers. So we have to put power back at the local level in local communities. And there is a challenge then for architects in particular, um, and that's what we're focusing on today. One approach would be to let technical achievements try and uh, lessen the damage that we do, but otherwise carry on as normal. And I think that is the widespread approach that we've seen emerge over the last few years since the late 80s when ideas of sustainability first emerged. It's been assumed that if we make machines more efficient, if we cut down the greenhouse gases of buildings and if we reduce the uh, resource depletion, we can pretty much carry on as usual with a few technological adjustments. But I think the challenge that faces us to achieve real sustainability involves a much more profound shift of values within society. If we are truly to reassert the value of community and society and to do it in an equitable and socially just way such that we no longer derive our wealth on the backs of exploitation of the third world, then we need a shift in value towards a much less materialist uh, form of society. And the design challenge that presents is not just how to make our buildings uh, more energy efficient. It's not just how to reduce the depletion of uh, limited natural resources, but it's also how to design buildings and communities which reflect these new values in just the same way that the architecture of the 80s has reflected the thrusting uh, capitalism of the Thatcher era, and we all can all think of Docklands this morning, with its technological buildings thrusting further and further into the sky, we have to develop new design concepts which reflect a much more ecologically based outlook on community and on human society. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Jonathan Smales, former director of Greenpeace and uh, founder and chief executive of the Earth Center, which is a 100 million pound uh, national millennium landmark project. Jonathan. Thanks very much. <coughs> well, we've got
got a very short time this morning, um, so I'm just going to rant at you for a few minutes and forget what I was going to say. I'd also no idea what the other people were going to say, and as, uh, as Mike uh, put it, uh, Teddy Goldsmith has already, I think, established uh, the global perspective and the theoretical basis for um, the, today's discussion. Um, Teddy uh, was one of the editors of a book called 5,000 Days to Save the Planet. Well, the planet's fine. It's been around for five billion years and will be around for probably many more billions of years. It's our own species that we uh, need to be particularly concerned with. We're a kind of insignificant uh, historical blip uh, in the planet, and we really need to start thinking about our own uh, security and survival along the lines that Teddy then uh, described. Uh, James Lovelock said that uh, the idea of humans managing the planet was like uh, putting a goat in charge of a garden. <coughs> now, I think there's going to be something called a millennium mood uh, at the end of the 1990s, where if you think of the average uh, New Year's Eve, uh, when you perhaps drink too much and you get a little bit sort of nostalgic and uh, reflective and grumpy at the end of the evening, then you wake up in the morning with a hangover and the year 2000, we're going to have 2,000 hangovers. And um, it's going to be based upon this kind of, I think, a profound reflection by ordinary people as well as elites uh, on, you know, what have we achieved at the end of 2,000 years of Christian history? Where are we as people, as societies, with our economies? Uh, what are the key issues, the key challenges of our time? And what the bloody hell are we going to do about them uh, in the next century? Uh, and there are some new phenomena here. Uh, uh, the principle of which, principle one of which is the global economy. Um, but very uh, frightening environmental and social considerations to be taken into account when we do that audit uh, at the end of the 1990s. Um, there are more people alive uh, today than were alive in the whole history of the Earth uh, up to the Second World War. It's an extraordinary statistic. Uh, and they're at 5.4 billion now or thereabouts, probably more, uh, projected to increase to 11 billion. Uh, by the middle of the next century, 2050. Some economists have talked about a factor 10, which is that uh, with that population increase and given compound economic growth that's projected by our, uh, in inverted commas, economists, <coughs> uh, that we need to be 10 times more efficient in our use of natural resources per unit of industrial output just to maintain the existing unacceptable level of impacts on the natural environment, 10 times more efficient. Now, uh, you know, we can perhaps plan a technocratic future in which that could be achieved. Um, it's not inconceivable, I suppose, that uh, that factor of increase could be achieved, but I doubt it. I think it's much more sensible, wiser uh, at the millennium to think about alternative strategies for achieving that based on um, resurgent local economies and, and communities. Some of the things I think that need to be taken account of uh, in that consideration, clearly energy efficiency. Uh, and many people think that we could be 60% more efficient and the remaining 40% if we assume that we need to um, have the same kind of uh, activities, human activities that we have today, could be generated from renewable sources. Now in the period of transition, uh, that may be difficult for many people, the aesthetic impact of uh, windmills uh, on the edge of areas of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, into the, uh, the balance sheet when looking at those, we need to consider global issues, global environmental issues and economic issues as well as uh, the aesthetic. Investment in photovoltaics uh, is uh, very promising and I think Corinne will be talking about that later on. Um, <coughs> uh, two weeks ago we had the highest ever energy use in the United Kingdom, uh, a week last Thursday, I think it was, um, the highest ever. So that despite all the talk about sustainable development, and we had the orgy uh, in Rio in 1992, uh, the biggest ever gathering of world political, industrial, uh, and in, uh, community leaders coming together, 600 jets a day flying into Rio. And the collective um, pollution impact of that probably outweighed any of the benefits that emerged. But it was significant that they were acknowledging the scale of these problems and beginning to think about strategies and then completely ignoring them afterwards. Um, we need new international protocols. We, we need to avoid trying to manage the planet and to think locally, but nevertheless in the transition, we're going to need international agreements on things like energy use and climate change, CSCs, uh, biological diversity. 
Um, but principally, I think that politics needs to be delegated to the lowest possible level. And again, in the period of transition, I think that regional and city state politics are going to become much more important with far more accountable politicians. In the area that we work with, the Earth Centre in South Yorkshire, people don't vote for policies and ideas and people, they vote for a political party and have been doing for 50 years. And that will need to change with greater accountability. <coughs> Um, we're going to need new environmental technologies, and there are wonderful technologies being developed. Uh, and I think we have to, we, we've got to be seen not to be anti some of the progress that's being made uh, in technology, in industry, in science, that really can make a valid contribution to a sustainable future. And we have to reclaim damaged land uh, and wildernesses that have been lost. Um, before we get too critical of um, people in the Amazon and the loss of rainforests or our cliched idea of what a rainforest is, we should remember in this country that ancient woodland uh, is declining faster than the rainforest in the Amazon. And on my site for the Earth Centre, uh, we have an ancient woodland that's threatened by quarrying just on the edge of our site. That's uh, trees that are over 500 years old declining faster in Britain than the Amazon rainforest. Um, there are all kinds of damaged industrial lands, and the spirit of renewal and reclamation needs to be applied to that within cities, uh, on the edge of urban areas, and in communities. Architects clearly have a, a very important role to play in this, but working in partnership with local people, finding ways to get your ideas across, whether you're a high-tech modernist or uh, a different kind of architect, uh, it's imperative to in engage and involve the people that you're building for, the wider, uh, forgive the phrase, but stakeholder community uh, in an area. <coughs> Urban design, I think, is important. Uh, it's not just the natural world that we're trying to protect. We're trying to enhance uh, the city life, you know, uplifting environments that people have created, beautiful environments, beautiful buildings. Uh, beautiful gardens and landscapes and farms uh, within the city area. It's a tremendous challenge, I think, for architects uh, in the future. Uh, in farming, um, I don't know whether we'll need to be organic. We certainly need to change our farming practices uh, immeasurably, and I think the principal requirement uh, is to farm to produce food for, food for local markets. Again, in the area that I'm from, South Yorkshire, you probably can't buy anything uh, in the local markets that's been grown within a 50-mile radius of the area. And to get a mango, and I quite like mangoes, but to get a mango to Britain from where it's grown costs 50 times the energy value of the, the mango itself. <coughs> and I think that that would reinforce a sense of place, of distinctiveness, a variety of quality uh, in local areas when farms are actually producing things for people who live in those areas. And we need complete places, which is to say that not necessarily self-sufficient, but they're looking within a regional economy to meet their principal needs and requirements uh, as a society. And that you should be able to find most of the services that you, you need on an everyday basis in your own community. Schools, transport systems, shops. All the shops in my village have completely closed down now. I had an argument with a vicar um, on Wednesday evening about the importance of cars. Um, and you, you almost have to have a car in our area because the children can't go on the road on the bicycles because it's too dangerous. And so to get them to school because there's no public transport, you literally have, because there's no school nearby, uh, then you have to have uh, a vehicle. Um, so the whole series of overlapping issues have already been touched upon this morning. I'm very, um, I'm not optimistic personally about the future, but I think that there's no choice, there's no other agenda but sustainability, defeating the glo global economy and creating a local one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Philip Komuchian uh, has been with the Richard Rogers Partnership since uh, 1980. Uh, he studied at the Architectural Association and worked on the project London as it could be in 1986. More recently, Philip uh, has, been, uh, has also worked with uh, Richard Rogers on the Wreath Lectures. Please welcome uh, Philip Komuchian. Somewhat daunting being an architect following these um, very impressive speakers. So it's rather good that I totally disagree with some of what's being said, although I agree with a lot of the principles. I think the first point is that, the, that there is, as Edward was saying, that uh, there is nothing normal about uh, the Earth. The Earth is not normal. The Earth is a changing and it's a dynamic system, constantly changing. There is no constant in the sense of 
an ability to go back to a, stabi a stable climate. It has changed, it will continue to change. Yes, we are a blip in the history of, of the planet. Today, half the world's population live in cities. And this figure is likely to increase to three quarters of the global population by the year 2025. There is no turning back in that context. This basic human habitat is the major source of pollution and the greatest consumer of our resources. This fundamental habitat of our species. And we tend to have an incredibly cavalier attitude, society generally, towards the idea of our own habitat. It seems to be one of the issues that is of least significance in terms of people's general perceptions and certainly in terms of political debate. Our habitat, the habitat of this huge species, is kind of ignored. In global terms, this habitat is, is breaking down the ecosystem and creating social patterns for ourselves which are alienating and divisive. Again, in essence, we've got that stock now and there is no turning back again. We're not going to turn it back to little villages. The future of humanity is going to be determined in cities and by cities and citizens. Yet, again, this habitat is being basically constructed for financial reward by the private sector and for political expediency by a lot of governments around the world. The citizen has been alienated to a large extent from the decision-making process, and that is, in a sense, the core of the problem. I want to propose sustainability as idealism from the point of view of a supporter of development, from the point of view of an architect, urban planner, somebody who therefore believes totally and, and optimistically in the idea and the concepts of development, be they redevelopment rather than necessarily development. Urban sustainability is about environmental and social harmony. It's becoming an incredibly broad subject requiring special specialties from all the, the sciences and all the sociological sciences and the arts. It's fundamentally modern in the sense that it challenges existing values. And I think that is the principle of modernism which, that, which I believe in the most um, passionately in the context of this question of are we going back or are we actually challenging what exists today and changing things and creating new family structures, new community structures, rather than thinking that we're going back to medieval family structures, limiting structures, in my opinion. It, um, the, the whole idea of urban sustainability proffers the dream of an ideal but dynamic city, a city in which man's basic human rights and responsibilities must be respected. A sustainable modern city can only be the product of citizens who acknowledge their mutual dependence on nature and community and who commit themselves to a responsibility to future generations. Sustainable urban planning allows the global perspective to inform the city plan. And that, again, is a, is a complete departure in terms of an approach a, a, and a new one to do with a global understanding taken down to the level of city planning. It's a holistic approach which balances the social needs of the community with the technical imperatives of modern life, not a rejection of those, but actually trying to balance those needs. It seeks to balance the inputs and outputs of resources and yet to create a cultural climate capable of providing security and inspiration. Again, the key issue that separates our species from the animal kingdom is the whole notion of inspiration and imagination and creativity. The role of the public realm in this is, for architecture and urban planning, one of the critical issue. How does actually, how does the, the public realm interact with the social culture, which is the, the missing ingredient in today's world? How, how can we make our cities again nurture the social culture of our, so, our society and allow changing social cultures? City planning becomes a holistic exercise in social as well as environmental dynamics. It's about architecture which interacts and enhances the public domain, about transport strategies which protect street life, and about a totality which respects the environment. Sustainable urban planning allows a citizen to tackle the global environmental problem from their front door. It brings the question, it brings the battle, if you like, for global awareness or, or saving, if you like, or protecting or balancing nature to the scale of the city and through the city to the scale of the citizen. 
it brings the concern for the macro into the heart of the neighborhood. It's a global approach which fundamentally relies on the cooperation and involvement of the citizen in decision making in their neighborhood. It's a micro policy which has ironically come to age because of the information age and the macro society. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. The next presenter, Roger Kelly, is an architect with 25 years experience in practice, teaching, and research in sustainable architecture. He is currently director of the Center for Alternative, and Te Alternative Technology. Thank you. Right, um, I'm going to be far more specific about uh, one of the roots of sustainable architecture, and I'm also going to uh, show you some pictures. So um, I'll depend very largely on the pictures to tell the story. Um, right, um, this route that I'm going to talk about is the route of disenchanted urban dwellers, the ones fed up with the pollution and noise and all the side effects of, of urban living, who retreated their way back into the countryside in search of some kind of Arcadia dominated by the cycles of the natural world, the cycles of the growth of plants, of the seasons of birth and death. Now, in this country, in the UK as a whole, um, this largely took place in the early 70s when um, the more wealthy people retreated to uh, East Anglia and the west of England and uh, the less wealthy retreated to the Celtic fringes, Wales and Scotland to start with, and then, then Ireland. Um, now, this search for an Arcadian past has always been dominated by and overlaid with degrees of political anarchy. Um, from the extreme individual self-sufficiency, or a myth of individual self-sufficiency, to the kind of high communalism that was um, brilliantly portrayed by um, the, the drawings of Cliff Harper. If ever, any of you have seen those, either in the magazine Undercurrents or in that seminal book, Radical Technology one of whose editors is speaking soon. Um, right, the next slide, thanks. So the architectural manifestation of, uh, of this retreat into the countryside started with the, the rediscovery of vernacular building, the rediscovery of buildings which grew out of the natural landscape and returned gracefully to the natural landscape when they came to their end of their lives. Uh, constrained by the availability of local materials, constrained by local skills, and adapted, on the whole, to local climatic conditions. So this was seen in many ways as being a template for a sustainable architecture. Um, now from this, this beginning, this rediscovery of vernacular building, I've identified two divergent paths towards an architecture which sits lightly on the earth. That's one. The first of these is what I'm calling a more organic approach, often influenced by the architectural philosophy of Rudolf Steiner. Um, it has a very large spiritual and thereby anti-materialist dimension to it, and it's probably best exemplified by the work of Chris Day. But in its more fundamentalist form, it ties in with groups like Earth First, um, the TP Village. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> That's one. Uh, the true New Age travelers, and most topically, of course, the, the tree houses and burrows of the, the Newbury Bypass protesters. That's one path. The other path focus much more heavily on technological innovation, but in a very holistic way. So looking at the interrelationships between building energy systems, food production, waste management. And from that, the phrase alternative technology was coined. And it, in turn, gave birth to rural communities such as BRAD, which stood for Biotechnic Research and Development, and the Center for Alternative Technology. Now, the nature of this integrative work, the kind of skills involved and the costs involved in experimenting with them, um, presupposed in many ways that the experimentation happened at a community level rather than the individual level. 
Um, but at the same time, there was a parallel movement, um, which we can call the aut uh, Autonomous House Movement, sorry, thanks. Um, which was pioneered in this country by Robert and Brenda Vale. Um, this actually, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, that was the last one. Next slide, thanks. Um, yeah, this one's actually the Granada House of the Future, if anybody remember that. And uh, the autonomous house movement sought solutions at the individual household level. Now, this path in particular has spawned a growing number of architects, um, many of whom are associated with something called the Ecological Design Association. And they are trying to combine the kind of rigorous life cycle analysis of materials and components <coughs> with near zero energy uh, in use solutions and the integration of renewable energy systems into building design itself. These architects, the architects following this path, are also, uh, most importantly, moving from the rural environment and beginning to tackle the problems of the urban environment. But also, interestingly, there is uh, beginning to be a coming together of those two divergent paths, um, uh, which is probably best symbolized in some of the work that the, the Fintorn Foundation is doing at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Um, Godfrey Boyle is director of Open University's Energy and Environment Research Unit. He is co-author and editor of Renewable Energy, Power for a Sustainable Future, published by Oxford in 1996. Godfrey. Okay, well, I seem to be unfortunate when I come to the Architectural Association. I should have, was going to bring some slides of, slides of Cliff Harper drawings with me, but decided they were too old hat and decided to bring some overheads instead and discovered there was an overhead projector. So you'll just have to listen to me speak. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've d decided to c entitle my talk Sense and Sustainability, partly because I can never resist a good pun or a pathetic pun, as those of you who know me well will know only too well. But having said that and decided on that title, I decided to hunt around and try and find a Jane Austen quote on sustainability. You might think this is that she didn't have a lot to say about sustainability, but you might be wrong about this. And how about this one? It is a truth increasingly acknowledged that our single planet though in possession of a good endowment of natural resources, is in want of husbandry. Well, that wasn't quite what she said, but I'm sure if she'd, she'd been around today, she would have put it something like that. As an academic, I'd like to start with a few definitions. Um, Brundtland Commission defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future gener generations to meet their needs, which is all very well. David Pierce defined things in much more narrow economic terms. That's basically not depleting our natural capital, which is, again, fair enough as far as it goes. But I feel that these are ne necessary but not sufficient conditions. And in my view, sustainability really should be defined in terms of harmony, an old-fashioned word, within people, between people, and between people and the planet. To me, that's the, the broader and more acceptable definition of sustainability. But having said that, I think that by no means everything should be sustained. And as Teddy and others have no doubt said one of the problems about speaking last is that everybody said everything. Um, of course, consumerism, you know, I shop, therefore I am, does not, should not be sustained. High resource consumption and wastage, centralized transport intensive structures that currently prop up the system, the very atomized individualistic and alienated society that we have, our alienation from nature, and particularly the glaring inequalities that prevail at present really should not be sustained in, in my and most people's opinions here, I suspect. Sustainable effort, sustainability, therefore, in my opinion, should in, entail intrinsically justice and equity, not just between generations, as many sustainability advocates have proposed, but within generations as well. I mean, as Murray Bookchin, who's one of the pioneering eco-philosophers, has pointed out, uh, much of the well, most of the exploitation of nature that goes on is due to the, our exploitation of one another. And so if we're to stop exploiting nature and have a sustainable world, we should stop exploiting one another. And I feel, in fact, that without the sustainability in the broad sense that I'm trying to refer to, an unjust and sustainable society won't really be sustainable, oh, sorry, an unjust and inequitable society would not really be sustainable in the long term anyway. I think it's important also that we need a set of deeper values and ethics than merely those of the marketplace 
I think people need a sense of connection to a larger whole, including the planet and all the species on it, what might be called a Gaian ethos and Gaian set of values, or even, if you like, a Gaian spirituality. And with, although with all due respect to the religious views of everyone here, I wouldn't myself like to see a return to the superstitious and authoritarian religions of the past. Um, but I would say that also a sustainable society need not be a static or stultifying society. I think we need uh, to balance the need for sustainability against the need for some change and some development and some creativity in society. And therefore, I think we should have a dynamic sustainability. Some change is desirable, I believe. But of course, the present rate of cha change, I certainly would say, is much too great. Some people, like Kevin Kelly in his book, Out of Control, which many people may have read, say that human societies flourish best when they're, when they're on the edge of chaos. And I think that there's a lot of truth in that, but I think that perhaps we need our society, our sustainable society of the future to be not so much out of control, as Kevin Kelly would perhaps put it, but as just in control, uh, an element of order, but with a lot of creativity going on and a bit of creative anarchy at the fringes. Um, and finally, in order to move towards a sustainable society, I think we need to do more than just uh, think globally and act locally, as the saying goes. We need to both think and act globally and locally. And my old friend Peter Harper, uh, who um, I think who was the co-editor with, with me of Radical Technology, put it, I think, best in defining the integrated approach which I feel is required. And the way he put it was that the important thing is to work on all fronts at once, the home, the neighborhood, and the workplace. Likewise, we must be realistic and full of fantasy, attend to public needs and individual consciousness, create a bal balance of mental and manual work for everyone, a measure of city and country life, focus on immediate problems and build for the future, live in earnest and just for fun, confront and compromise, have our cake and eat it. Why not? Thank you. Our next speaker, Gustav Metzger, artist and writer, defender of nature, last lecture that year in 1965. Gustav. Yes. May I add the last big lecture in 1965, but there was a, a minor key lecture in 1972. <laughs> it's still a long, way, a long way back. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be back at the AA. I hope I won't offend too many of you with my rather heavy political statement. Now that the Cold War is over, is it okay in terms of, uh, now that the Cold War is over and the old enemy, the Soviet Union has collapsed, only one enemy remains, capitalism. And capitalism gasping for survival in a world that it has decimated, pins its hope on one idea, sustainability. The sustainability of the system, to achieve this, all the old tricks are employed. The Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit had a sustainable world as its theme. Months before it started, in the spring of 1992, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations had written it off. And in the months following the conference, it emerged that it was indeed in the nature of a fiasco. My essay, Nature Demised, Resurrects as Environment, was completed in the summer of 1992. And it was written in the anguish and despair I experienced at the time, at this betrayal of hope. Sustainability is a topic raised in that essay. I'm arguing that there's an interrelated cycle of pollution and degradation of nature tied into a cycle of repair and making good. This interrelation between damage to large and deliberate intentional damage in order to increase profits and simply to maintain the capitalist system, this interrelation is structured in the system and could be seen a as a conspiracy. But the central point of the essay is fixed at the beginning and it is this which I seek to bring to your attention and I'm grateful to the organizers for presenting the first key passage in the introduction, page 11. 
the term environment is now so misused and overused that it has literally lost all meaning. The term has to be scrapped. Instead, I propose the terms nature and damaged nature. That is to say, nature is the raw state, including, as just human nature, animal nature, the broad perspective of what has been and what we hope we will regain in the future. And what we have now, damaged nature, which is environment. So at least let us consider this possibility, maybe in the terms of the discussion uh, or in the future. And may I add that the, the book, Damaged Nature, Autostructive Art, has been published very recently by or Coracle work for the I2. I have a few copies here. If anybody wants to look at it or quiet during the interval, please come up to me. Could we look at the slides briefly? They're not all that relevant, but and, well, this is a kind of icon of our time. You would have seen it again and again. And uh, the next one, please. <coughs> This is a GM on the South Bank, in 1961. I'm sure many of you know this image too. And there, of course, you've got an environment, that is to say hydrochloric acid, being sprayed onto nylon sheets, which disintegrate within a 20-minute period. And so can I say something that you now, now know? Gas mask at that time didn't seem to make much sense, but today uh, you see them in Oxford Street. Uh, even a bus driver had a mask on the other day. So uh, if I, you won't mind me saying I'm now 70, I think this is a kind of prophetic image way into the future. And please go on, among others, but it has to do with the environment, uh, damaged nature. That's detail. Please go on. Now there's Tal, I think a very profound artist of our time who creates this uh, amazing uh, observatory in the desert and I imagine this is a view onto nature, an artist's vision of our world. Now this is a scientist's vision of our world. You have seen it a few weeks ago in the mass media. And uh, what I'd like to say here in conclusion, we had these images of the Earth from Apollo. And it was said, this will revolutionize our relation to the cosmos. Well, it hasn't so far, but I'm feeling that this kind of image, which we are getting more and more, could find our, help us find our place. There are, I think, 15,000 million galaxies in this image. Well, whether it's millions or billions doesn't really matter, but an incredible amount of galaxies. And the article, uh, you will have, you can recall, says that if uh, you took a piece of dust and you dropped that dust on the ground and down there you may or may not see the dust. Now Hubble, the Hubble uh, telescope focused on a space in the cosmos as big as the piece of dust would be to the naked eye. So this is a piece of dust in, in the cosmos and it contains millions and perhaps billions of galaxies and we've got one galaxy. I think when this permeates consciousness, it may actually do some of the tricks that we desperately need. Thank you. Uh, I think we probably have something like um, maybe 15 to 20 minutes uh, for um, questions and if I as the chair of this session, maybe permitted to uh, ask uh, the first question while everybody else uh, gets their questions ready. Um, it really has to do with a slight um, clarification. Since uh, this session is, after all, entitled What is the Political as well as the Theoretical Basis of Sustainable Architecture? And in anticipation of the symposium that we have coming up next Saturday on Architecture and the Labour Party, I think it would be important to uh, develop a little bit um, further this issue of decentralization and uh, in particular the relationship between decentralization 
and uh, some of the issues that I think Philip touched on to do with the city, um, the city and its uh, citizens, question of citizenship and uh, our uh, political and ethical responsibilities to the other. Uh, I'm personally not very familiar with uh, the current political situation in the UK, but uh, as far as the United States is concerned, uh, a great deal of the movement towards decentralization also has connections with the radical right in one sense and uh, the, the political and religious aspirations of the radical right. Would maybe this could be addressed both to Edward and uh, uh, Mike, would it be possible to elaborate on this point in terms of the relationship between decentralization and its more specific political aspirations? <clears throat> the trouble with politics today is that our political parties share the same views. There's no real difference between the views of Mr. Blair, in my opinion, and Mr. Major. It's certainly the case in other countries. There's very few differences. They all want the global economy. They all believe in further development. So the politics of it all, I think, is going to change very dramatically. It may well be there'll be a new realignment. In France, there's already a new realignment. You know, the people for or against big trade, Maastricht, uh, GATT. In the last presidential elections, you had the splinter groups from all the parties, from the extreme right to the extreme left, the communists, against the GATT and split away and formed their own parties. Chevin Moore from the socialists all the way up, to Le Pen and the communists. So you see, there may well be a realignment, which is a view of Wendell Berry, that the main issue in the next decades will be the, the local versus the global, and you'll have the, what he calls the parties of community. Now, one thing we tend to forget when we talk about moving, continuing in the present direction, is that we are heading for the marginalization, the global economy, must inevitably lead, and I repeat the word inevitably lead, to the marginalization of something like two-thirds of humanity. People don't seem to realize that. And just say, you know, we have, by signing the GATT agreements, we have written off the working classes of this country. We simply tell them, gentlemen, we don't need you people anymore. I mean, we can get labor 50 times cheaper in China. What do you want to employ you fellows for? We don't even need you as consumers. We can export the stuff we make to, to richer countries like, uh, like, like uh, America and Japan, so go to hell. And we can't afford a welfare state because how can we compete with the Chinese if you pay you, pay, pay, you, pay you, you people welfare? So we are committed to this automatic, um, to massive unemployment. Don't forget, we're living in a period. We tend to forget that. We're living a new industrial revolution, as dramatic as the one that occurred in the end of uh, the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, because we're transforming industry to make the, mass, the best possible use of the computer. It's called re-engineering. When you re-engineer industries, you are sacking between 40 and 70 percent of their staff. And if you take into account that, plus the fact that where a vast number of industries are going to shift, the industries are now transnational, they are stateless, they can go where they like, they no longer have to be English. Coca-Cola, for instance, announced the other day that it was no longer an American company, it was a world company. It is having six divisions. Only 20% of its business is now in America. It's got American, American, this American end of the business is just one division, no more. So Coca-Cola can easily leave America altogether if America passes laws which um, they, they find up upsetting, which they put up taxes or tries to, to, to constrain their activities in any way. We have created a world now of totally out of control, uncontrollable, massive transnational corporations that are being scouring the globe in search of cheap labor, lax environmental laws, and no one will be able to control. And therefore, your industries are going to shift. You're going to shift. We can foresee massive, massive unemployment. Here in this country, it could go up 60, 80 percent. Who knows? And not only that, not only that, but those who remain in, in employment are going to have slave labor, slave wages, because we have to try and compete. That's what the only policy of this government in economics is to attract foreign capital. And to attract foreign capital, they've got to say, we've got the cheapest labor in Europe, is what they're saying. You don't have to, no, we're not going to pass any laws to uh, increase the cost of industry. They're doing that right now. If you, want to, if you want to know, see that, write to the Invest in Britain Bureau over the Department of Trade and Industry. It tells you just that, to try and attract foreign capital. We're moving to a pair of incredibly low wages, Mass uh, short-term contracts to replace long-term contracts, massive unemployment. It's going to be much worse than the third world, much, much, much worse. Now, what's going to happen? So you're the majority of people are going to be marginalized. Uh, it won't last for long, because how can your industry survive if everybody's paid slave wages and there's one in private? Who's going to buy the things they produce? And uh, I know that industry, industrial leaders are pretty worried. Computers are very poor uh, uh, consumers. 
What are they? Who are going to sell them to? But in the meantime, there's going to mar mar going to marginalize a vast, vast number of people, probably the majority of people in the, in the, in the world today are going to be marginalized. Many are going to destitute. It's inevitable. And these people will tend to organize themselves. And they'll organize themselves to create new communities and new local economies by necessity, or they'll starve. And at the same time, they may well create a new political party which will be defending their interests. If they're the majority, one day, they'll be, it's quite possible that there'll be a new party which will be committed to a decentralized society, committed to representing all the people who will be marginalized by the global economy and who are reorganizing their own local economies. And that, that is the view of Wendell Berry. It's a view of a number of people in my, a group of people I work with, International Forum on Globalization, with the book that we, we've done, which is coming out in September. So this will change the political scene, put it dramatically, as it will change all sorts of other scenes as well. with what Edward's saying. I, I want to add, hopefully briefly, a few um, so, sort of more immediate political considerations. And that is that depending on who you ask to make your decisions, you will get a different range of answers to the questions you're putting for decision. What I mean by that is if you allow the World Bank and the World Trade Organization to control the global economy, well, they only think about certain criteria in making their decisions and they have only a subset of the range of uh, information that is available available to them when they're reaching their decisions so they will necessarily come out with a decision whatever it is which reflects their criteria and given that they're operating on a global scale where uh, with certain views that money is most important and that if a country a third world country for example uh, is experiencing problems in repaying its debt, then it should cut back on social provision. That's the prevailing assumptions, and it has only global level information available to it. It's inevitable that it will impose a regime on that country which is destructive socially and environmentally. So if, as a Green Party or just generally ecologically motivated people, we want to reassert a range of values in the decisions that are made that reflect the value of nature and society, we need to take decisions at a level where those things, the natural world and society, impinge most heavily on decision makers, and that is at the local level, because the first people to know about environmental degradation and societal degradation are the, the, the marginalized, quite often local people, who it, it affects most strongly. And that's why if we want a sustainable world, we have to decentralize. Just to pick up on the question of who, who are the forces for decentralization, well, they, they aren't just the ecological movement, the green movement, they are the right-wing movement also. Because they, in common with the green movement, they do have one thing in common, it is that they resist the globalization forces that the predominant world market economy is bringing to bear on us. But they do that for very, very different and for very dangerous, in my view, reasons. Because they typically take a very simplistic view of my group is good, the outside world is bad, therefore I want to push the outside world away. In, in that way, I think because of that, the green movement uh, has to be an internationalist movement for decentralization. It has to say that people living in community in harmony with their local environment all over the world are what are, uh, they are the important people. So together throughout the whole world we have to build an internationalist movement for decentralization rather than any sort of supremacist movement or nationalist movement. Um, the, the only problem is that in the current political debate over things like Maastricht, the Green Movement and the uh, extreme right wing of the Tory party will often on a specific vote on a specific issue find themselves uncomfortably, from my perspective, on the same side. Okay, two things. One point, namely that um, I, I agree that we should try uh, and very much distinguish ourselves from the extreme right, but we equally should rebut the idea that just because one particular party espouses an idea, then it, it must be wrong. I mean, just because Hitler was a, veg was a vegetarian doesn't mean that all vegetarians are Nazis. 
So, I mean, essentially, we, we do need to uh, uh, acknowledge that there may be people on the far right who have certain ideas in common with us, even though they have certain other ideas that they very definitely do not have in common with us. But we shouldn't shrink from decentralization just because the far right espouses it. this huge group of people who, will, who are outside a lot of the mainstream activities are actually going to be using computers, are actually going to be using mainstream technologies to their own advantage to make up substructures, small-scale industries, small-scale economies, which are going to take on these big global organizations. The whole irony in all this is that in the international movement for decentralization is the irony of our times, given to us by the global information and the global age. And it's going to be different. It's not the same as it was before. We cannot go back to the past. We're going forward, and we have to reinterpret, which is exactly the business of architecture and urbanism. Could you perhaps rephrase the question? The, the question was, could you please state at what point did the whole concept of damage nature begin? Because as soon as you put two stones together, you begin this process of damaging. That's right. Well, uh, if you look at the essay, that's exactly what it says. It goes right back to the prehistoric man who was the first person to create environment. Uh, so as far back as you can think. And I suppose even animals created some form of destruction way back in prehistory. <coughs> uh, would you like another expansion? Oh, yes, yes. yes. What, what did they have to say from the, the sort of Stone Age man, Bronze Age man, <laughs> etc.? Was there a time before that, or could there be a time after the naming of society as Homo Faber into a new type? Yes, well, I'm just suggesting that animals themselves damage nature. Animals you know, are very, very destructive beings. And since animals go back before humanity came on, it goes back, damaged nature goes back to prehistory as far as up to those stars. They are constantly damaging each other, aren't they, by that ex explosive energy. The, you can say that the entire cosmos is damaged nature, and as far as it's continuously destroying, creating, and damaging itself. I hope, I can't say more than that. I think perhaps we've made a mistake here by assuming that uh, damage to nature is not the natural way. Perhaps damage to nature is actually the natural way that things are. And it is sustainability has got to be all about change and adaption and continually learning how to live and, and, and work with our environment and whatever set of circumstances are available to, to us at any point in time. I think it's a mistake to assume that we can freeze or go back. We're, we're always faced with whatever our current situation is and trying to make the best of that in a social, in a political framework and in an ecological framework. And the fact is we have got a large, a large uh, global population and we can't go back and suddenly say we haven't. Those people are going to need housing, they're going to need jobs, they're going to need um, continual development and, and it, it's, it's just an impossible situation that we have to come to terms with. And we have to find practical ways of dealing with that. We can't just, I think, wish ourselves back into the past. That's not, not a way forward. But I think that the, the, there are some clear limits that need to be established. And I think um, it's not an issue so much of whether we damage na nature, it's the extent to which we do. And the new phenomenon uh, in the 20th century is the number of us doing it. There are, uh, uh, my population statistic is really real. It's not imagined, it's not a theory. And also we have far more dangerous technologies now. There are more than 100,000 synthetic chemical compounds. We don't understand the interaction of two of them in the natural world, let alone 100,000 uh, of nuclear wastes, of uh, jets flying in the upper atmosphere. Our capacity to cause damage has been 
uh, multiplied exponentially while our populations have been multiplied exponentially. And, and, and so the concept of limits is, is really important. And it's also quite liberating, I think, because once you've defined a certain boundary to uh, material development, one then looks for cultural developments and spiritual development to replace um, the sort of self-indulgence, the temporary self-indulgence that comes with excessive materialism. And I think you know, the idea of cultural cities that Philip described uh, is really a very rich one uh, for architects to, to, to engage in. <laughs> Randall Thomas from Max Fordham and Partners. I like the idea of limits, and in the 70s there was a question of the limits to growth. Could I ask the panel, what are the limits to sustainable development? <laughs> well, of course, this brings in the whole question that uh, we've addressed of whether, by definition, there's a, there's a contradiction between sustainability and development uh, and I have to uh, lay my cards on the table and say that I'm in the camp that believes that it is possible um, that the world is developing and will continue to develop and um, um, what we have to do is to find um, this this edge of limit um, within which we can um, provide a level of sustainability and um, I can't remember who it was now that uh, made the point that, of course, it's not, we're, we're not talking about the, the sustainability, the, the survival of the planet, but of, of the human race. Um, it's, it's, it's one that I always find a very salutary um, thought, that um, in the end, we're looking at it entirely selfishly. We're saying, how can we, as a particular species that hasn't been around very long, survive on this planet? If we were to mess up the planet entirely and wipe ourselves out, the planet would recover, albeit in probably a very long time scale in a very different way. I don't have an answer as to what the, the limits to sustainable development are, and I don't believe anybody has. I think all we can do um, is, is to put all our energy, all our effort into understanding the way the planet functions uh, into understanding the way that human society functions, into understanding the way that the human population is developing, and, uh, and search for those ways in which we can achieve the survival of the human race. I don't think there's any other way. There, there is a very powerful, new, rather simplistic tool uh, called footprint analysis. I don't know if anybody has heard of that, where it's possible to calculate the amount of land that any particular activity would take uh, that is required for that activity, either in terms of providing the raw materials that you need for the production, or uh, in terms of the amount of land that you would need to set aside to absorb, and at the moment the model only deals with carbon dioxide, but to absorb the carbon dioxide which is pr uh, produced by consuming the energy for that consumption. and. Uh, it's, so it's a very simplistic calculation, but you, you can, doing that calculation, calculate what resources are available and what resources are being used. And just using this very simple model, we know that North American, the mo North American lifestyle um, would require three planets if everybody was living at that level. And that uh, the lifestyle of you know, the, the tribe's person in Papua New Guinea is probably sustainable because it is not demanding more land than is available. And I think although the figures are gross simplifications, it's absolutely clear from this analysis that the global footprint of all human activity on the planet is bigger than the space available in which to put the foot down by a factor of about 1.3. And so human society is not sustainable and just curbing the worst excesses of what we're doing now is simply helping the Titanic to sink a little bit more gracefully. And we actually need uh, a very large-scale re-engineering of human society to make it sustainable. 
within those broad parameters, I think the limits are defined. I think there is no, um, um, I think sustainable development by definition um, is sustained. It's a question of how boring it is. Uh, and, um, you know, one doesn't want to design uh, a sustainable world that's uh, got a poor quality of life, and I think that that's the key issue. So it's not just, you know, will our species live forever, but it's, you know, how will we develop as a species? How will we fulfill our uh, social, spiritual, sexual, and other needs? Uh, and how much will we enjoy doing that within the limits of nature? But, I mean, the language is really difficult here, I think, and I don't think we should allow the, the development lobby, the global economy, to steal the, worlds, the, the words of growth and change and dynamism and development uh, from us because they've only got one definition of it. And I think I prefer the term developing sustainability, but I think that development where it encompasses uh, positive change for the future, cultural change, uh, renewal, spirituality, is a very, very important concept indeed. It's come to mean economic growth, and it can mean all kinds of other things. We must rescue the language uh, from economists and, and international economic summits. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, a number of things. Um, first of all, I think it's important to realize that in the last 50 years, we've probably done more damage to uh, the uh, planet we live in than we have doing the, the rest of our tenancy of this planet, just in the last 50 years. Just consider that 50 to 60 years ago, the forests of Southeast Asia were intact. Countries like Peninsula Malaysia, where there's practically nothing left, was covered in forest, 70 to 80% forested. Sri Lanka was nearly 50% forested. You can't find any forests now. As Kerala was 40%, was 50% forested. You've had uh, the, uh, Vietnam until very recently. I mean, just until a few years ago, you know, until, I mean, you're talking uh, uh, Laos, Cambodia, all these places were totally forested. There's practically nothing left. In the last 50 years, the destruction has been monumental. And that's best, uh, uh, Barry Commoner's book, The Closing Circle, just shows you that 50 years ago, if we go back to the war, we didn't have synthetic organic chemicals, as Jonathan pointed out. We didn't have synthetic fibers. We hadn't got a nuclear industry. We, we hadn't built any big dams except the Hoover Dam in America. Perhaps all the very big dams have been built since. All the, we didn't have the technology for wiping out forests in a few minutes. Massive, all the technology for wiping out fish stocks overnight. I mean, in the last 50 years, there's been absolute destruction. And I'm absolutely convinced that there's no way in which our planet can sustain another 50 years of that sort of treatment. It just will cease to be capable of sustaining complex forms of life. That's number one. The other problem is that um, man has always destroyed things. This is a very misleading statement. The, the destruction that uh, tribal people are supposed to cause are basically those who have moved from one area to another. When the people crossed over from the Bering, across the Bering Strait into North America, from Siberia, and the, these are most of our American Indians, uh, uh, they, of course, found themselves in a totally different world, and they had not l learnt to live in that world. And that, that this notion of learning is very important. You adapt to living in a particular world without destroying it. You move in, and they wiped out all the, the megafauna of North America, the mastodon, the different camelids, or uh, the American horse. And the hound, all these animals were wiped out in a very short time. Just like when the Maori went to New Zealand, they wiped out those big birds, the moa, these colossal creatures. But then they, st they learned to live with the environment. It took time, and it, what is astonishing is how they managed to adapt to these, all these different tribes of living in their environment afterwards. If they destroyed their environment when they moved in to an environment which they never lived in before, they're behaving just like other forms of life. Man is not different in that respect. You would take the walking catfish or the fire ant or the, or the gypsy moth and all the animals that have ravaged the American environment, they've come from abroad. They move in, these animals destroy everything. It takes thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years before they can actually learn to adapt to the, to the, to the environment. But in the meantime, they're either become extinct or cause the most terrible destruction. And man is exactly the same thing. He's got to learn to live in his environment. It takes him a long time. But tribal man did know. He learned. It's quite astonishing when you read the sort of the ecological, the whole literature on the ecological anthropology, like with the actual Dolmatov, Roy Rappaport. There's a lot of this material coming, just showing you how they knew how to adapt to their environment, which we do the opposite of. Talk about change. You see, it's somebody important to realize that the change was, li the li living world did not change for the sake of change. A totally static natural system, whether you're talking about a society or an ecosystem or biological organism, is not stable because it's got to be able to adapt to a changing environment. But, uh, but it has to change. But in order to, p to maintain its basic structure, 
and that's what uh, that's what stability must be. It's got to make small changes, and the changes that it makes are changes required to prevent bigger changes. If I want to maintain the basic structure of my body and put my hand in the fire, I've got to take it out pretty quickly. If I'm chased by a lion, I've got to run like hell or climb or go somewhere. If I want to make the basics, I've got to make movements. I've got to change. And changing, change you can be seen in that light. It's not change, perpetual, you see, endless, unilateral change in a single direction towards, to, to as we're doing today, which is what we believe in, which we believe in progress and development. So this, I think, I think uh, that, that, is, uh, that, is, that is tremendously important. Now, I don't believe that the life of traditional man was boring. That I do not believe. Now, if you, uh, I really don't believe it at all. They had an incredibly uh, elaborate existence, which is reflected in their vocabulary. Many tribal peoples have languages with 10 to 20,000 words that we know about. 20 to 20,000 words. Yeah, when the Maori, there's all there about, if you take the book, massive book on the plants of New Zealand, I talk about New Zealand because my wife is from there, you'll find that there's a Maori word for every single plant. Their knowledge just of the plants that surrounded them, you know. They probably had two or 3,000 words just for the plants. Now, you take the average fellow you pick up in the street in, in New York or here, you'll find they have a language, a vocabulary, a total language of 300 words because they live in a totally dull, environment of, of cement buildings, a degraded environment, simplified environment, one which, uh, which, is, which is simply not stimulating in any possible way. Which is, the life of tribal man, traditional man, was incredibly elaborate. You should get here a Henry Norberg Hodge, I don't know if you've ever got her, who, who lived in Ladakh, you know, and she really understood this society remarkably well and has documented over 20 years what's happened to it as it developed and how life in general has been degraded. <laughs> Two things. One, I can detect tremendous amount of contradictions uh, between what is being said and what is being done by some of our leading architects, for instance. I would like a, an answer to a simple question. Should we still build high-rise buildings, which are well known to be highly energy-consuming in, in their construction and in their management. And the second point I would like to leave with you is that we haven't really considered the whole of the Pacific Rim, what is happening there. I happen to have some experience of it when I tried to advise Beijing on its urban planning and future. There was a moment, and there sometimes is in a city's life, when a historic decision has to be made when the city can go one way or another. There was a moment when Beijing could actually have skipped the motor age. All the conditions were there. But this was not, this was even accepted by the then mayor of Beijing, but it needed a feasibility study into which no international funding agency was interested because it wasn't a capital project. And this, I think, is a very important point. But the whole problem of these, of these developing countries is simply they, are, they have seen what we have got. They want the same thing. And who are we to tell them you can't have it because it's not sustainable? So this is something you might like to discuss in the future. associate a question like can you build high-rise buildings from the urban planning issue and the density issue which of course means that we have to look at this thing in a much broader way so there is no answer to that question I'm sorry. <laughs> um, just a few comments I find it odd that several of the speakers refer to the third world still that, and I think that anyone who's thinking about the issues that we're talking about, um, you know, surely we've got beyond a sort of us and them approach to, um, to, the, to the world that involves 
talking about the third world or developing countries. Um, secondly, that, uh, and we mention has been made of the um, rapid damage in the last 50 years, described in terms of forests being cut down in Malaysia, Kerala, etc. Completely forgetting that all of our forests were cut down hundreds of years ago. The whole of Britain was completely um, <coughs> covered in forests, and uh, you know, we have responsibility for that rather than trying to um, displace the responsibility onto shift the blame elsewhere at the moment. Um, and thirdly, I find it odd that having made all of those comments, then um, what are described as traditional tribal societies are rather patronizingly held up as models that we're meant to be aspiring to. <laughs> well, I use the phrase third world. It's a difficult one. I prefer the fr phrase, and I take it this is a debate about phraseology rather than <coughs> anything else. Um, the phrase the South is better, but it's very easily misunderstood because you don't know which South you're referring to. Also, I have considerable experience with the charity Third World First, which operates in Oxford, and they call themselves Third World First. Um, <laughs> And so it's, it's one of those debates about PC language, which is never very uh, helpful. But Well, sometimes it's helpful, but it's a bit of a distraction. But I think if it is patronizing, it does also get across one of the main points about the countries about which I am talking, um, which is that in just about every pecking order going, they are put at the bottom, and we put ourselves at the top. five-minute break just to set up for the next session, uh, which will be the design challenge. <coughs> what is a sustainable environment? Thank you. Oh, and it's a friend of yours. Design challenge. Uh, my name is Brenda Bell. <coughs> I'm an architect who has had an interest in um, trying to make buildings more environmentally responsible since being a student over 20 years ago. Uh, but I also teach architecture still at the University of Nottingham. And for some reason, I've been allowed to actually give a, a four-minute introduction as well as acting as chairman. So could I have a could I have a slide, please? Is that possible? Just, they're just sorting the slides out. Chance for people to sit down. Thank you. And we, we will try very hard to stick to our four-minute slots for this particular session. I'm afraid it's always up to me. It's, it's always wait till your mother gets home before punishment in our household. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about the particular design challenge that we faced in trying to make a, uh, a house that actually got all its um, resources from its site. Uh, the house, as you see, is um, in a conservation area in a small town of 10,000 people, um, which is interesting in terms of communities because everybody knows about it. Uh, and it's also acted as a kind of local catalyst because since being built, the local district council are very keen to put some of these ideas into social housing, which they're doing at the minute. Can I have the next one, please? All we were trying to do with this house was to reduce its need for space heating to zero through actually insulating the structure and making a building that was thermally very massive. Um, I, the slide just demonstrates the fact that there's 500 millimetres of cellulose fibre in the roof plane. Can I have the next, please? Uh, we have a conservatory on the south side which actually shortens the heating season so that we're only relying on um, body heat over the three months in the middle of winter to actually heat the building and stored heat in the mass of the house. At other times, we can actually open the house up to the conservatory on, on its west side. See here, the next place. Uh, we collect rainwater off the roof. 
And this is actually the technology that has fired local imagination the most. And I think it was interesting to talk, hear, hear the first panel talking about the limits to what people will, will accept. And it seems that privatization of water is actually something that people do not want and are not prepared to accept it. Um, but we actually collect our own water off the roof, uh, store it in 20 Israeli orange juice tanks, which are recycled uh, in the cellar. And at the end of the drought, we still had 60% of our supply left. Next, please. Um, to do that, we compost all our sewage in a Clivus uh, composter, in, again, held in the cellar. And we collect the fertilizer from that, and we grow tomatoes with it. And we've now been through two years worth of cycle with that. And the next, please. And to make the energy we need, um, we have photovoltaic panels on a pergola in the garden, uh, which gives us uh, energy for cooking um, and for electricity needs, lighting, etc., within the house. And this was just our attempt, as I say, to try and, to try and derive all the resources we needed for this particular house um, from, from its own site. I think uh, the, the paper, I, the little um, synopsis in, in, in the book has got some actual numbers in it, and I would, I think, make a plea for numeracy. We can talk a lot about the spirituality of trying to make sustainable buildings, but in the end, unless we know what we can collect and what we need and what we actually use, we, have, we cannot design anything that, that meets those kind of targets. Uh, in terms of cities, and of course an awful lot of cities are actually at suburban densities, and we shouldn't forget that, but if you look at a typical suburban three-bedroom house, the energy that runs it all year is about the same on an annual basis as the energy of the breadwinner commuting half an hour to work. But both those amounts are less than the energy that flows through that house in terms of the food consumed within it. So the single most effective thing you can do to reduce energy is to actually grow your own food. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop there, if that's all right. Um, I'm just leaving you with that thought, perhaps. And I'd now like to introduce David Tarrant, who's the managing director of ECD Architects, uh, um, a firm of which, of course, we're very, very familiar, uh, a firm with 20 years' experience in low energy design. And David is also a member of the RIBA Energy and Environment Committee. So, David, thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, if we can have the first slides, please. M my concern here is with, um, really with the, the, the role that buildings have to play in terms of um, national CO2 emissions. And I'm going to, um, <coughs> sorry, these are not, not my slides. <laughs> We hear a lot of, um, we hear a lot talked about low energy design, low energy dwellings uh, in terms of new build, but of course the rate at which we're replacing this existing housing stock is, is, is very small and, and we have 95% of, of, of um, the stock which will exist in the year 2000, um, 2010 already. So we really have to focus um, very much on the existing stock as the means in order to um, drive down CO2 emissions in this particular sector. Um, and as architects, we have, um, we have a particular professional responsibility, I think, to, um, to focus not only on energy efficiency, um, but also CO2. And the, uh, the, the, there should be two slides in, in sequence. Brenda asked for some numbers, so uh, here are some numbers. The slide on the, on the left indicates the, um, the importance of, of buildings in terms of national CO2, uh, which runs at about 600 million tonnes of uh, CO2 per annum. And as you can see, buildings account for 50% of that transport 25% and, and other sectors um, the remaining 25%. The feeling is that um, the hopes of reducing CO2 in the transport sector um, are, going to be, are going to take a long time to, to, to realize. Um, 
the scale that you know, we need major changes of policy, we need changes of infrastructure, <coughs> we need changes of technology, and, and those are not going to come through very quickly. Um, we do need to achieve the savings which um, the, the government committed itself to at, at Rio, um, and indeed one might argue that those that, that, that 10 or 20 percent um, cuts in CO2 are, are only actually skimming the surface and, and that in order to counteract the effect of, uh, of growth in developing countries, you know, the westernized world actually needs to make bigger cuts and, and in fact Germany, I, I, um, I understand, that is, is targeting 30 percent um, CO2 reductions by 2020, which is a very, very um, tough target to, to reach. So, um, so in terms of, of, of buildings, what can we do? Well, the existing housing stock actually accounts for 30 percent of that total, something like 158 million tons of CO2 per annum in the existing housing stock. Um, roughly, it's, it works out at about eight tons per annum per household. So if we all individually take home the target of, of getting our own CO2 emissions down at home by putting low energy light bulbs in and, and, and um, putting condensing gas boilers in and, and all the rest of it, we can do individually, we can, we can contribute to that. Um, the other important sector, obviously the public sector, um, local authorities and housing associations are in control of, of something like 26 percent of, of the existing stock and can invest in that stock in order to improve it um, and at the same time as reducing CO2 um, they are also alleviating fuel poverty which is um, endemic um, within the public sector ho uh, housing. So if we could just uh, move on. I just want to give an example of two projects that we've done in the, in the East End. Um, taking um, existing council estates which were um, in a very poor condition, built in the 60s, no maintenance carried out at all, um, inefficient concrete structures, um, leaky windows, poor heating. But surprisingly, we're finding tenants in some of these flats were spending a thousand pounds a year on, on, on fuel um, because they have to use on peak electricity to, to, to maintain um, satisfactory comfort levels. Um, and we came up with a package which um, basically overclads the building with 100 millimetres of insulation. Uh, we put new individual gas-fired central heating systems in. We put ventilation um, into kitchens and bathrooms. So it's, it's an integrated package of measures, um, which, t which together with um, other longer-term features like re-roofing in order to give the buildings a further 30-year life. Um, we're spending something like... Um, 30,000 30, pounds per dwelling, but what we're doing is achieving a total transformation uh, of, of, of that building in terms of its quality, in terms of its uh, future long life, in terms of comfort and amenity uh, for the residents. And the, the result of that is a 50% um, <coughs> reduction in, in CO2 emissions. Um, the next two slides, please. Another example, um, also in the East End, on the slide on your left is, is the, was the existing entrance to the building, believe it or not. A hundred um, <coughs> residents would approach that building. You can't actually see the front door. Um, it's a windy, hostile environment, um, which has been transformed, um, as you can see, to create um, a, much, uh, a much improved um, environment uh, for, the, for those people. And this, this is an example of what was... Uh, referred to earlier is the combination of, of um, intervening to improve the quality of urban, the urban fabric and at the same time um, make very significant inroads into CO2 reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, could I now ask Dr. Derek Taylor to speak to you? Um, Derek is a, a member of the Open University, works at the Open University, but is a former student of, of the AA and was a founder member of the Rational Technology Unit, which some people may remember in the 1970s, in the days when, as he described it, students knew more than teachers did. 
uh, which is probably still the case, of course. Um, and he is, of course, also well known as, as uh, an international wind power expert. Derek. Hello. I, uh, I was asked to try and come up with suggestions about what a sustainable environment is. Um, this is tricky from the point of architectural design, but the things which came through to me were that if a, the resulting building or neighbourhood does not add environmental stress as a result of its construction, the materials being used in its construction, and energy or any environmental effects of its co occupation, the servicing of the building, the wastes arising from it, and travelling and transportation to and from it. And I don't think that's really sustainable, achievable actually, but uh, how far can we go? Um, well, to some extent it's actually getting to the stage where you think about things before you actually start designing the building. Um, asking the question of whether a new building is actually required, whether an existing building can be sufficiently modified, and whether the building's location is easy to get to without having to reliance on the on the car, and this obviously takes the uh, design of the building into a much wider area. And I think it's important to take these things on board. Another point to make about uh, even if you design a new green building, every new building will actually add to the energy demand unless it's designed to super insulation standards uses low energy equipment and obtains pretty well all its entire energy requirements from renewable sources. Uh, this is particularly important as, as David mentioned, 50% of the CO2 released in the UK is consumed in buildings. And in many cases the building itself can convert renewable energy from the interaction of its envelope. This is one example. Um, which I'm working on with Dave Olivier, where we're actually making use of photovoltaics in the, into the structure, but also designing the building so its energy requirements are as minimal as possible. He's also intending to take account of the embodied energy by planting his own orchard. So essentially the, the roof is clad with photovoltaic cells um, we're also using some new Canadian super windows which have a positive energy balance. And somewhere here. This is the internal temperature environment against the external temperature. This is modeled on Siri Res. And the indications are that the temperature conti continues to free will within the comfort zone. However, photovoltaics, are, whilst they're effective and they're going to be an important issue in the future, they don't generate much electricity in the wintertime. So one of the approaches that we're also looking at is combining uh, methods of extracting wind energy from the flow of the surface of the building. This is an uh, Aeolian roof structure which takes the shape of the curve of the um, ridge so it accelerates the airflow. And we reckon that for the average roof length for the average house, it should generate all electricity requirements for a low energy house. Um, we also think it can work on the size of tower blocks by a simple cladding system. You have a, a, a rotor which is completely enclosed and should be acoustically very quiet. Um, by the shape of the structure, we can actually accelerate the airflow so we can get augmentation through. Um, if I can show just a few slides. Okay, um, one of the most important things which architects are often still forgetting about is orientation. Uh, just orientating the building and facing the south can save you 15% of the heating energy and obviously gives you much better interaction with the sunlight. Next slide, please. Okay. 
Uh, just a quick overview of the renewable energy potential in the UK and, and its importance. And wind energy is obviously the most dominant, but also biofuels and uh, photovoltaics as promised in the future. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of a photovoltaic clad building in uh, Germany. There are about 2,000 roofs underway and operating in, in Germany, and the whole technology has been well assessed. Next slide. Um, the other approach with using uh, renewables is actually at community level. Um, in this case, you have a community wind turbine, which people can either get together and buy and, and benefit from the sale of the electricity and uh, energy savings. Another ex slide, please. And something for the future. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to John Newton, who is an ecologist and runs his own consultancy, also being the Environment Director of Crane Environmental, um, which is a consultancy for the construction industry. And he's also co-author with that, with that book, Building Green, by, um, with Jacqueline Johnson, which is a really useful book about plants on and around buildings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks to the previous speakers for really enlightening stuff as well. Thanks for the five-minute break as, as well, because I think the sustainability of my talk was severely threatened by an intake of uh, natural substances, i.e. caffeine. So uh, thanks to that. Um, this whole thing about sustainability, I think, is, a, is about talking about limits, actually, and defining what the limits are. Some people would like uh, limits to go right back to as they used to be when biological system, we were just part of it. We were just one part of it, and whether we tap stones together or not, didn't really make a great deal of difference. Other people see it as an economic situation, particularly when they're raiding the tropical rainforests of South America. For me, there's a great cultural aspect to it. So the whole thing about limits is very important. For a lot of local people, it's what's happening in their environment today. So to talk about the big picture of sustainability is great, and it's nice to have everybody here today. But for the person out on the street there, they probably don't even aren't really sure what sustainability really means. They probably think it's something to do with sexual performance or uh, s some other related issue. They don't understand the fundamentals of it, and we're not talking to them about it. In fact, we should be out there talking today, not talking to ourselves. I th see it as including man-made wealth as well as natural wealth, and we need to start tackling the issues now rather than tomorrow. And there's a great deal of information and resources which are available to us, and we've heard some of them already, and we'll hear more later on today. Environmental quality at every stage of the building process. This is what needs to be highlighted for everybody. Look at the site, understand the site. How many architects really understand the site that they're working with? The materials you're using, where do they come from? What are the environmental costs of those materials? How do they contribute? not only to the energy levels within the building, but also its aesthetic contribution to the landscape. The overall construction process, how is it put together? It's no use building a very nice building if it's been, done, if it's been put together in a fairly destructive way. Environmental management plans can be all part of that, and site environmental management plans in particular. And architects and even the major construction companies are taking an interest in these issues now, and that's a major step forward. We can slag off Rio 92 as being a failure in lots of ways it was, but in fact it generated some useful bits of paper. Even the UK uh, Action Plan on Sustainable Development is a useful bit of paper, if only to hit John Gummer over the head with. We must make sure that people are aware of these things and are starting to take action of themselves within companies and at the local level. Quality of life, rather than standard of living. We need to look at people's social needs, rather than how many hi-fis they have, or color tellies, or videos, or whatever it might be. Health, employment, equality, if we can achieve it. Cultural and aesthetic needs, extremely important. And connections with the, the natural environment. Brenda's already mentioned the book uh, Building Green, which I wrote with Jacqueline Johnston. That was all about 
dressing up buildings, if you like, with vegetation, which can have a significant effect in terms of energy use of the building, the, the aesthetic quality, health of the people who work within the building or live within the building. And I'm also very concerned about green spaces within, within cities. And we mustn't divorce the built environment from the green environment, particularly in the city. Our parks are in a desperate state they're really falling into dramatic decline. And it's all right to dress up the built environment, but it's pe people gather in the parks. People need that green space. So let's look at the green space in our cities as well as the built environment. My third point is respecting the local. We've heard already quite a lot about that. Vernacular architecture is always a hot issue. But it's about the use of local materials, the use of local labor, the effect influence of local culture, local society on a building. And local agenda 21 and sustainability and all those issues have a great part of them is about consultation and involvement of local people. Unfortunately, one of the problems we face today, and Edward Goldsmith mentioned this, is that we have a loss of community. And if we think of our cities today, there are in fact lots of different communities which have difficulty in relating to each other. <coughs> Black and white, young and old, rich and poor. And that's a big problem which we need to address. Paradoxically, perhaps one of the ways we can address it is by using environment and, it, and things like Local Agenda 21 as a means of bringing those disparate communities together and focusing what, on what their joint problems are. The final thing I'd like to say is the whole thing about commitment. One or two people have mentioned spirituality, which I think is extremely important. And Andrew Yates from EcoArc, uh, I heard him talk a few weeks ago about spirituality and sustainability, and he was great. And I can't, I'm not gonna attempt to uh, repeat what he said, but I think it's very important. And all of you here today have shown some commitment to doing things better in the future. And we need to take that out into the streets and into our companies, into our organizations, and ensure that commitment runs through. Because if it doesn't, then all this talk about sustainability is really pastiche. It's not going to get us anywhere. We're going to have open minds and open hearts and really start to tackle these issues seriously. So let's get the commitment going today. Can I have my slides, please? Because I haven't been hijacked. Yeah, OK. Very quickly. Oh, they're over there, right? <laughs> Confused me. Uh, King's Cross, around the back of King's Cross, Victorian architecture, shrine to mammon in the past possibly, but nevertheless an enduring landscape. One of the things about sustainability, reduce, reuse, recycle. We certainly shouldn't be demolishing buildings like those. We should be reusing them. Reuse wherever we can. Next slide, please. Broadgate, will that have the same impact in the future? Will we really want to reuse those buildings? All that cladding that we put on buildings today, does it really mask bad architecture? Lots of granite and marble, really precious materials used to mask bad architecture. That's a question. Next slide, please. Uh, token gestures in Covent Garden. Next slide, please. Uh, not quite there at Stockley Park. Next slide, please. <laughs> Camley Street Natural Park, definitely there. Really succeeding and really doing good stuff. We need more of this and its relation to buildings. Next, next please. And there's an appropriate building for Camley Street Natural Park. Um, an ecologically friendly building in an ecologically friendly place. Next slide, please. Or is that the last one? That's the last one. Oh, right, okay. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Um, could I now introduce um, Co Corinne Millet, who's the Solutions Campaigner for Greenpeace. Corinne. Thanks a lot. I really only want to say a few things. I'm far more interested in debate than uh, lecturing you. Uh, firstly, a couple of points about sustainability. Now, when, when we were asked to, to come along to this, the word sustainability is a bit of a dread word in Greenpeace. It's one of those words a bit like BNFL or Shell. We, it's, it has this um, strange worry about it because essentially it's a meaningless thing. 
Um, what sustainability, sustainability is used to represent is pollution in many cases. It seems that everyone who's polluting the planet is somehow sustainable. And perhaps the, uh, the height of that is, you know, we've heard about the Rio Summit, is this organization called the Business Council for, S for Sustainable Development. I mean, it's an arch proponent of sustainability. And what it includes is every single company that produces all the chemicals and the products that destroy the environment. So it's a very, it's a very, very strange word. And it, it has, it gives you the hope that there's something that can happen with it without going through the issues about the power that, that lie behind pollution. I remember a couple of years ago, we were asked by the DOE to join in a, in a round table on sustainability. It sounded good. We thought we could all sit around, chat about it. But at the same time, what the government was doing, a different department, was commissioning thought. Now, you can't sit in one room with one government department talking about sustainability, and in, the, and in another room, a decision is being made about opening reprocessing plants. So that's an anomaly between the, where the discussion is and where the power lies. And I suppose we look at it in terms of this is what you say, what do you do? We say that to politicians, we say it to companies, we say it to the public. This is what you say, you say you're sustainable, what are you actually doing? And we'll judge you on your actions, your deeds, and your record, not on your words. Because of course companies love to talk, and uh, governments love to talk, and we try to talk to as many of them as possible, but we don't want to talk, we want to see a bit of action. And uh, I suppose in this debate about buildings and architecture, what struck us in amongst the range of issues, both within the building fabric, and it's been you know, raised about CFCs and other issues that you do, is about the very nature of what drives buildings, which is energy. Um, can I have a slide, please? The oh, it's over there. For us, um, global warming is one of the biggest threats. Now, trying to summarize that in one slide is imp almost impossible. I mean, the manifold threats of global warming to the planet, you can add up into pages and pages. But I picked this one out because um, it relates to hurricanes and floods. And what global warming will do will eliminate nation states. It will eliminate nation states from, from this planet. So countries in the South Pacific, other areas, will just disappear. The people will disappear, the governments will disappear, the institutes will disappear. And that is one of the areas what it does. Uh, next slide, please. And this is why coal power stations burning fossil fuels. That's the problem. Global warming is, is what it causes, is, is the result of it. So you have to eliminate the sort of pollution, like you eliminate CFCs. You try and eliminate um, those things. You don't manage them, but you have to end up, if you want to have sustainability, you've got to stop using these things and not try and use them better. Of course, in, that, in the uh, buildings debate, the first thing you have to do is use it more wisely. Energy efficiency is very well known amongst all of you. I don't really want to talk much more about that. You know that the role it can play. But when you've done those measures, when you've done that 60%, what happens then? Your building is still plugged into this pollution. So you have a choice, and the choice is to use something like solar power. And we decided that we would campaign on this ourselves because it's one of the most available technology you can use to eliminate the problem. You've got a solution to eliminate the problem. And that's really what our message and theme is t today about this area with buildings, is if you build a building and you say it's sustainable and it's plugged into fossil fuels, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to use renewable energies? And that's the critical test for anyone who's involved in a building, whether you occupy it, you build it, design it, or you buy it, or you sell it. And that's really what I want to say at the moment. Thanks. That gives us a different definition, I think, of a sustainable building, which is interesting. Um, can I introduce Randall Thomas, please, who has degrees in mechanical engineering and architecture, and he's now senior partner of Max Forderman Partners, uh, with a particular interest in environmentally friendly and excellent architecture. And he's also not only the author of that standard student text, Randall and Thomas, being the Thomas bit, um, no, Littler and Thomas, sorry, no, let me get this right, Lit the red book, I know what I mean. Um, but he's also author and editor and principal author of Environmental Design, which is a new book published last month, which I haven't yet seen. Thank you. Firstly, thank you for inviting me.